Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium exploration, but I think also likely lithium and, uh, and potentially nickel exploration uh, as well today. We will hear from ALX Resources Management, uh, specifically Warren Stanier, Chairman and CEO. During today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook, uh, then we will take questions. You can type in your questions into the chat box at any time. We will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first, we need to discuss a bit of fine print. During this ALX webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of uh, the ALX corporate presentation. That can be found on the company's website, alxresources.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on ALX resources. Uh, with with that, uh, I now turn it over to Warren to update our audience on ALX. Thank you, Timothy. Nice to be here today. Um, I'm CEO and Chairman of ALX Resources Corp. And the title of this presentation is Exploration for an Electric Future. I think we're all becoming well aware of the decline in fossil fuels use and the shift, this transition time that we're in. And we're looking for the metals that are needed to achieve that. There's our forward looking statement, which uh, Tim mentioned. Um, our QPs are all listed for some of the content or all of the content you're about to see. So ALX, who we are, where did we come from? We are the result of a business combination of Lakeland resources and alpha exploration in 2015. And prior to that, uh, we were uh, Alpha Exploration was a spin out from the takeover of our predecessor, Alpha Minerals, by Fission Uranium. We had a 50 50 joint venture with Fission at Patterson Lake, made an incredible discovery. Uh, one of us had to take out the other, and Fission uh, did that. So it's now known as the Triple R deposit. So it did a little bit of wood shedding last night, which is now 102.4 million pounds uranium indicated, 32.8 million pounds inferred, a total of 135.2 million pounds. So we now explore for critical metals. Uh, uranium was always the focus of ALX and its predecessors until it really started to decline sharply in 2019. We looked at nickel properties, some claims were coming open. Uh, we did stake uh, some nickel deposits. They're not non-compliant historical deposits in north of the Athabasca Basin. But our uranium projects are still viable, nickel still viable, and now there's lithium that has entered the mix. So rather than just be an observer to that and being that we're involved in the critical metal space, and the electrification of our society, lithium is obviously a big part of that. A little bit about us, uh, myself, I've been involved for 26 years now. I don't know why it went so quickly, but it did. A few discoveries in, in various companies that I've been in. Discoveries are great. They make our shareholders very happy. Jody DeRouge, one of our directors has also been involved in discoveries and most recently the Corvette Lithium Deposit, his group, DeRouge Geological Consulting, was involved from the beginning of that. David Miller, a very successful businessman and legislator in Wyoming, has been involved in uranium in the United States for his entire career, as well as gold and other minerals. Jean-Jacques Gautreau former chairman of the World Nuclear Association. He lives in France, uh, knows everything about uranium materials, 
and the uranium supply and demand. Howard Hogan, a Vancouver-based businessman, a representative of one of our major shareholders. Patrick Graining, a CFO with vast experience in public companies, lives in British Columbia, as I do. Charles Roy, one of my mentors. Um, Charles was with Cameco back in 1999 when a company I was with did our first deal with Cameco, an, an option earn in by Cameco. And he's been involved in the discovery of seven uranium deposits. I can't name them all, but I know Millennium was one of them. Uh, Seared Eriks uh, is a technical advisor now. He stepped back from full-time employment with us in the last year or so. He acted uh, for ALX for a number of years, worked for Orano, what is now Orano, formerly Areva, worked for Cameco, and worked for us. Dave Court worked with Orano most recently. He's a brilliant geoscientist, a geochemist. I first met him at the Saskatchewan Research Council back in 1997. And he, among others, Alistair McCready, Dave Cork, these were people that taught me about uranium and the mineralization process. Ken Wozniak, a uh, very important person in uranium, for sure. He has a proprietary program for determining clay mineralogy and the percentages of certain clays that you find in when you're drilling for uranium and sandstone. Uh, I know that he was partly responsible for the discovery at Triple R because he told us, you guys are very close to a uranium deposit. And he was right. We were nine meters away. So the, this 22nd hole at Patterson Lake found the deposit. And the 16th hole was nine meters away and just had a couple of hundred parts per million uranium. So that's what our team brings to the table. Dr. Larry Hulbert, a PhD, worked with the GSC for many years as an advisor to our nickel deposits, uh, nickel exploration, which we are not going to discuss today because this was uranium and lithium. However, we can see it on the Canadian map. Um, Saskatchewan, obviously, we have a lot of properties and we've had a lot of focus over the years. We can go through the uh, uranium projects when we get to that section, but the Athabasca Basin in the north of Saskatchewan is the most fertile and the highest grade deposits in the world for uranium. And now we're starting to look at lithium in Saskatchewan as well, which was ignored for many years, as it was in other provinces as well. Uh, lithium and pegmatites was something you walked over. It wasn't necessarily something that you would consider drilling or making into a mine. So today we'll be talking about a couple of our uh, current projects and what, what will be happening in 2023 in uranium. Also, the crystal lithium project, a new one we announced today, reindeer lithium, hydrolithium in James Bay region, and anchor lithium in Quebec. So here we are, the future. Is this what our towns and cities will look like? Well, I like the picture. Uh, green. The green revolution is upon us and if you're not part of it then you're just going to be watching so definitely being in uranium was always energy related but now with the components for batteries being so important to our society that's nickel that can be cobalt uh, and of course lithium just a graphite pulled off the Canadian government website, fossil fuels use forecast. So this is over a 45 year period. We get from 2005 to 2050. So 45 years, we're gonna be down 62% is the prediction. Myself, I, I think that there will be a market for fossil fuels in certain vehicles and certain things. Uh, I have a plug-in hybrid uh, that I use, it, ha it takes gasoline and you can charge a battery so you get both. And I think, especially at this time, this is the transition that we're talking about where we're phasing out because obviously we want to use more electric. 
and it, it is cheaper than the cost of gasoline, which I think we know has gone up substantially. So, of course, the electricity demand in that same time frame is projected to be almost 50% higher. So Canada has developed a critical mineral list of which we are actively pursuing. So on this list for LCT pegmatites, that's lithium, cesium, tantalum, we see those three. We see nickel, copper, cobalt, which also occur together. And we see uranium, which I've highlighted in bold. So there's a joint action plan that's been announced by Canada and the U.S. to develop domestic supply, reliable integrated supply chains for these metals so that we're not held hostage by foreign powers. And I think we have had that happen in the past. It's always a tug of war between countries. We need to be independent and we're happy to be involved in the search for and the discovery of these metals. We've all seen this chart, I'm sure. The lithium demand, lithium ion battery demand, again, in the next seven years, there's going to be a huge amount of demand. And it, Volkswagen just announced the battery plant today for Ontario, Canada. Uh, it's, it's going to be producing by 2027, is what I read, just, just announced a few hours ago. At PDAC, we had Volkswagen representatives walking around introducing themselves at the booths. So there you go. So a little bit about our lithium exploration in Canada. First of all, <clears throat> there's three types of lithium deposits. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we have hard rock, which is the type that we're after. And that's green bushes in Australia. Brine deposits, which uh, this would be a solar down in South America, where the brine is pumped out of the ground into ponds, evaporated, and you end up with your product that you can refine gradually over a period of a year or two as the, this evaporation process occurs. And probably the latest one now is the brine deposit, or the clay deposits rather in Nevada and other places, Arizona, where people are working on extraction methods to take lithium out of these clays. And these are some very large deposits. In our case, we're looking for pegmatites, hard rock lithium. So this is our hydro lithium project in Quebec. Uh, we sampled there in October of 2022. We first staked in September, and I'll show you the map for that in a moment. But this was, uh, <clears throat> we had to wait for an hour <laughs> an hour. We had to wait for 30 days, a month, before we could go out on the ground. You, you must notify the Cree Nation of your intent to explore. So by the time that was done and the time period had elapsed, uh, we were getting into uh, mid-October and some bad weather. So in a matter of four days, we managed to visit four of our projects. And it wasn't as effective as I would like, but we needed to get out on the ground, so we did. So here's a map showing the James Bay area. Uh, the Corvette deposit is, is the one that all investors know. Uh, there is no size to that yet, except that they're getting long intercepts of multiple percents at times of lithium oxide. So it's obviously a looks like a viable project. We're showing two of the uh, known deposits on this map. There's a third one off frame to the south. But the James Bay and the Rose deposits have been known for quite some time. It's a mineral rich area. You have the Eleanor gold mine, Eleanor gold mine as well. So when we came in, we looked at what is available. How do we pick the areas that are still open? Where are there lithium enrichments? And we found those in lake sediments, for example. Um, and this is why we're there. It's these massive dams and the infrastructure created $20 billion worth of infrastructure in the last 30 years or so. 
the three deposits that are the most well known. Uh, obviously, they have large tonnage. James Bay has had some kind of a major uh, go ahead from the federal government of Canada. That's a good grade of 1.4% lithium oxide. That's a large tonnage owned by Alchem, formerly known as Ora Cobre. Uh, Rose, a, a smaller deposit and a lower grade, but as far as anyone knows, it could be economic. Wabuchi, they've tried a couple of times to get that off the ground and someone's going to give it a third try. So what's been happening in the last 10 years or so is better metallurgy. But as far as hard rock lithium, the metallurgy is pretty well known and it's been successfully employed for quite a while. So when we picked our projects, where do you start? Well, you, you look for lithium, you look for cesium, you look for tantalum. And we all, all we had to go on really was the lake sediments. So what we saw was leakage from these areas into the lakes. And that's why we staked where we did. This one is Echo, one of the first four that we staked. And here's a cesium anomaly, quite pronounced, leaking off the Nike property. So our goal is to get back out there in the time that we had in the fall of 2022, we only had 40 rock samples collected. Uh, there were some anomalous lithium values and other pathfinder elements, rubidium being one. But what we need to do, and we've, we have about $800,000 banked and ready to go for early summer into the summer, is visit all of our properties, all of them, and thoroughly prospect. So that means aerial an aerial survey from your helicopter, setting down, checking out the pegmatites. And where we do see pegmatites and where we do get some enrichment, that would lead to more work, uh, soils, all kinds of other testing that you might do to determine the extent and the fertility of these pegmatites. So around the same time that we staked in uh, Quebec, one of our consultants who's from Nova Scotia said, you really should take a look at Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia, I mean, what do you do there besides fish and maybe go to Irish folk festivals? But there's mining in Nova Scotia and there has been for quite some time. So what we're looking at here is the southern part of Nova Scotia, which has a nicer climate, definitely a nicer climate than what we have in other parts of the Maritimes. So this is why we're there. Brazil Lake, sorry for the scrawl. Brazil Lake is a known pegmatite, a lithium bearing pegmatite. Uh, there has been a staking rush in almost every jurisdiction that we've been in, including this one. So we staked what we call Drake and Yankee, kind of a maritime feel, both being pirates or privateers names. And that's why Anchor Lithium is, is also named for where we are, the region that we're in. I think people like it. We also see a, a big gold project, St. Barbara Holdings, formerly Atlantic Gold. So there's definitely mineralization in the area. At this time, we have been out on the ground due to the more, uh, the warmer weather that we see in this area. And we've gone to Drake and we've done a biological sampling program, which biogeochem that we'll see in a minute. But again, when we stake these claims, what we had to work with was lake sediment geochemistry. There's very little else to go on. And one of the reasons is that a lot of the pegmatites in this area can be buried. So the Brazil Lake has been sold, it was in the hands of a private company. It's now with uh, an Australian company that is not public yet, and they're drilling the heck out of it. So according to the gentleman that Mr. John Whiteman, who sold this property to them, he thinks that they've doubled this, these, these numbers already with the drilling that they've done. I mean, a private company can only do what they do over years Brazil Lake was first looked at for tantalum and by Australians, ironically, in the 1990s, not for lithium. Lithium was not on anyone's radar at that time. 
but the lithium is there. The grades are good. And as they keep working this deposit, uh, I'm sure that tonnage will increase. And there's an example of the type of lithium bearing pegmatite that we're looking for in Nova Scotia. This one has obviously been stripped and washed so you can see it. And that's why they're a little bit harder to find because you might catch some outcrop here or there, but there's a lot of overburden in this area. And that's why we're doing this. So what we have here, this is the Drake project. And I'm just trying to show the area where we have worked on recently. The yellow dots and red dots, this was during the program, which we've now completed. We're sampling red spruce bark. So trees and their ever-searching roots are burrowing down into the soil, into the rocks below. And that lithium and other metals will come up through the root system into the bark. It's a very cost-effective way to find buried lithium deposits. So waiting for these results now, and I'm looking forward to seeing a trend. I mean, it would be awesome to see something like, oh, gee whiz, look at that. We've got a red spruce bark anomaly. And that's the kind of thing that you do in exploration. You, you cast your net, you use the tools that you have, and if something appears, well, then you've got something to focus on. So we'll probably have to wait another month or so. To me, it was quite amazing that we could get this work done in December, January, and in February at the Drake Project. So it's nice to know that this is almost a year-round project in this part of Nova Scotia. So we started turning our, <clears throat> excuse me, we started turning our, attention to Saskatchewan, which is where I've worked for over 25 years and many of our group has as well. Lithium was not something that was sought by the explorers in Saskatchewan. But we now know, due to some work in the 2000s and fairly recent work, that there are lithium, lithium bearing pegmatites. This is in the north, our new crystal lithium project. We found this lodge that has an airstrip they have float planes, they have boats, they have everything that we need to go out and explore our new project. <clears throat> so this was the showing that was found in 2004. I'm sorry if I left that from the previous slide. So that circle is the Bailey Lake lithium showing. 2004, it was found by Saskatchewan government geologists. Uh, they were quite surprised to find these large blocks of uh, spodumene bearing pegmatite that had been glacially transported. When you see these little arrows uh, all over this map, that's the noted glacial direction. So our theory of Bailey Lake, that, that particular showing, we staked above it because we think that the source for those blocks could be up here. So that was our first staking. And sorry for the bad scrawl again. <laughs> we, we looked at uh, lake sediments in this area. There was a 1993 uh, GSC survey that was quite extensive, but ironically, they didn't analyze for lithium. But they did analyze for rubidium, for cesium, for tantalum. And hafnium is another one that, that we think, according to the USGS, is a a pathfinder mineral. So where, where we saw these uh, lake sediment anomalies from 1993 that coincided with the glacial direction, we staked to for the presumed source of the lake sediment anomalies. And again, what we need to do is get out on the ground this summer. That's the only way we're going to find these things. A little bit about why we like crystal lithium is because of the, the numbers that were found there. So 34, 3,470 ppm equals 0.741% lithium oxide. Now, that's a little bit lower than the deposits in, in James Bay and what they're showing, at least for a couple of them. But remember, these blocks have been out 
in the wild for thousands of years. So it's possible they've weathered down a bit. And it's also possible that you might get higher grades at depth. What I've noticed from uh, Patriot battery metals results is the deeper they drill, the better the grades get. So let's just see what happens in this area. Right now, nobody knows much. And Acme Lithium has picked up the Bailey Lake showing. We're all around it. Until people go there and find the pegmatites and find that these the outcrop that contains spodumene, which is the main lithium mineral. Nobody knows much. So we'll see what happens next. We, we also announced this morning the reindeer lithium project. So uh, going to the inset map here. So this is it's about halfway through Saskatchewan. It's on not far from the road um, between Larange and Flin Flon. This area was the site of a diamond discovery back in 2013, 14 into 15. Uh, this uh, area right here, North, North Arrow Minerals. That's their claims. Uh, North Arrow found kimberlites, but they didn't find a classic kimberlite with larger diamonds. I, apparently they're reviving this project now. So there is a huge fault that runs just to the east of the Piku, the North Arrow claims that I just drew on. And so this faulting and these, these major structures are probably why there's pegmatites in this area because they, they always find zones of weakness. What we do know is that the government mapped pegmatites in this area and their mapping ended about here in 1968. So this is a big unknown. Hey, let's see if I can draw a question mark. Hey, not bad. Again, getting out on the ground, waiting for winter to end. When the ground clears and we can get out there, there's enough inf infrastructure and lodges and uh, planes and places to stay that we should be able to cover and see these areas and look for the types of pegmatites that contain lithium because there are many types of pegmatites. So this is just another example of, of what we're doing in Saskatchewan and there's more to come. So our lithium objectives for 2023 to prospect at Hydra in James Bay, to prospect more and, and do sampling at Anchor, to prospect at Crystal and at Reindeer in Saskatchewan with more acquisitions planned if the price is right. So let's talk about uranium. <clears throat> uranium was my first love because it was worth so much money compared to everything else, even back in the 90s. Saskatchewan has a lot of it. It's produced a lot of it. Saskatchewan has uh, mineral wealth that most people in Canada don't really think about too much because Ontario and Quebec are so much larger and, and more well-developed, but Saskatchewan has huge potential for the next century. So our uranium projects are fairly numerous. Um, we have Sabre, we have Gibbons Creek, we have Black Lake, uh, Hook Carter, we're going to talk about Hook Carter today, and Sabre. Carpenter Lake, we've just applied and received a permit for, or we're about to, and we're engaging with the local communities there. Uh, also, going around the clock, uh, counterclockwise, Javelin Uranium, Mackenzie Lake Uranium, and Vulcan, which is perched in the middle of uh, a fairly extensively explored area. We managed to pick that up a few years ago. We've worked on all of these properties in the last year or so, except for Carpenter Lake uh, and Hook Carter. And we're going to discuss that in a minute. So here's Sabre. Sabre was sitting there in September of 2021. There was a staking rush on. Uh, were we going to watch people from Ontario staking everything in the in the Athabasca Basin or try and get the jump on them where we knew there was things that maybe they didn't know about. <laughs> so 
in this particular property, you, you have the Fond du Lac deposit. It's a small deposit found by the French in about 1970 or so. They traced boulders back to the source. They drilled, it's about a million pounds. It has a core that where grades reach about 3%. So not an economic deposit, but perhaps a harbinger of what's in the area. Uh, this is, it's important that, that these expressions are recognized and, and hopefully better understood. Although that one has no graphite whatsoever, which is usually a building block for a, a uranium deposit. So at Sabre, we, we have structures running through the property and lots of intersecting structures. There's been very few drill holes over the, over the years. Um, we looked at, into the files. There's radioactive showings, one of which we call the jigsaw zone in the southern part of the property. So looking into the files, we find airborne survey from 2005, a megaton survey. And there was two companies that, that flew at the same time, and they carved out each other's data from that one flight or the, the one survey was cut into two. So you had a, a, a slice down the middle that belonged to RPT uranium. And you had a, the other, each side was, was owned by a UX corporation. I was working there at the time. Um, there was a lot of competition. So there was no cooperation and we never really reached out to them or nor they to us. We were determined to do our own thing at the time. So there's RPT's data. So what do you do with that? Well, now it's all sitting in the files in Saskatchewan. So we've merged it, put it together. Now, these, these areas can be discounted because that's Richard's Lake. There's other lakes here as well. They're highly conductive and they show up in the, in the results. There's also a major structure going through here. Um, but we were more concentrating on some of the things we saw like in this area. So we decided to do some ground geophysics. And the ground geophysics, we did three separate grids. And that was just uh, recently, we, we managed to find uh, there was a warming trend going on in Saskatchewan and some geophysical company was unable to perform the work they were doing in the south, but it was cold up here. So we did these three grids and the one that was the most interesting is the middle one, which we call MNL02 because that was the name of a drill hole that had been drilled by UX back in 2006. So this is some of Ken Wozniak's work looking at the clay uh, mineralogy of this drill hole. So we're starting at 20 meters here. This is the upper part of the hole. Uh, the unconformity was just over 310 meters, which is not terribly deep. Certainly, uh, you know, we don't like drilling to the unconformity when it's 700 meters. It takes a long time and costs a lot of money. But what we do see in this hole is a dravite anomaly, which is a boron mineral. As a, a famous geochemist, Vlad Sopak said to me once, Warren, where we have dravite, we have uranium. And what he meant was that this is often found peripherally, peripherally to uh, potential uranium mineralization. So you can't ignore these things when you see them. Well, UX drilled one hole in 2006. It was really a prospecting expedition at the time and they drilled off the airborne. So what we see on this side, this is the airborne data. Uh, we designed a grid to help define this airborne data better. And what we ended up with was we modified the grid somewhat due to the time we had and the cost of it. It was all helicopter supported. So what we have here on the left 
is the bird's eye view or the plan view of our loop and the lines and the drill hole is just just to the south of the loop the old drill hole mnl02 that had that dravite in it what we realized from watching us from from observing the results of this particular survey is that mnl02 with our better defined conductor was drilled about 275 meters short of the target from my experience you, you can see dravite for hundreds of meters near where there could be uranium so in this particular case seeing the dravite there but they missed the conductor what we see now with the better definition of the conductor we've got a drill hole planned to hit the top of the conductor and that's where often these these graphitic conductors if it is graphitic would be uh, potentially altered from fluids there's more fluids moving uh, close to the unconformity so it's a pretty exciting target i don't know when we'll drill it we have to now permit for drilling and it would be a helicopter drill job so that's the next step at saber so let's look at hook carter <clears throat> hook carter has been quiet too quiet for my liking we sold uh 80 percent of this project to denison in 2016 and it was a great deal for us at the time uh, things weren't great in the in the uranium business at the time and to have this influx of money from denison and they were going out to work it was it was a gift in a lot of ways um, they drilled over two seasons in the meantime of course we have the this is the discoveries of triple r and arrow that are just magnificent discoveries <laughs> we already mentioned or i mentioned fissions 135 million pounds of indicated and inferred i looked up the uh, next gen numbers last night 210 million pounds measured 47 million pounds indicated 81 million pounds inferred and that's 338 million pounds all because of being nine meters away from a hole at triple r and then drilling that follow-up hole because one of our consultants said we should and then a great team working and using radon and that was fission's people it was our people as well and from that we have this this new district that was really ignored for many many years patterson lake corridor runs on to what we call the hook carter property we also have the carter corridor which the joint venture of orano cameco and pure point is drilling as we speak so the carter corridor is is really unknown the dirksen corridor there is a mineralized hole there from 1978 um, these are all mysteries that we're trying to solve we're solving them obviously in the patterson lake corridor but these other corridors have very few drill holes and that's the thing that needs to be done at hook carter so when you look at this slide we've tilted kind of given a 3d look at at the project this is an older slide from about three years ago because nothing's happened since 2019 on the property denison got busy with their other projects specifically phoenix Phoenix, they've done an incredible job on their in situ recovery program. It's, it's a landmark effort in the Athabasca Basin. So what we have is where you see the red blobs, those are the, the deposit outlines for Triple R, for Arrow. Um, maybe that's a little large for the Harpoon Spitfire, and now there's Dragon as well, I believe. Yeah, the Dragon Discovery. Uh, but the, what you see, all those blue lines, those are that's the drill density. For example, since 2013, NextGen has drilled 521 holes. 521 holes. So Denison has drilled 15 holes on our property. And what you see on some of these, 
these lines are showing the distances between holes at that time. And there are big distances between holes. So I was looking at the recommendations last night that were made back in 2018, 2019. And really we were just getting started when they decided to just pause at Hook Carter, uh, develop targets in a different way. So that's what I'm looking for, because it's been years since the hole was drilled. And what they have decided to do, well, here's an example of one of the holes from 2018. Um, we had a lot of the hallmarks of a mineralizing system. We had uh, that beat up, twisted, sheared graphite in the first hole. We've had all kinds of clay alteration. Uh, the one thing that's lacking, obviously, is, is that one hole that pierces uranium mineralization in, in a meaningful way. And I'm talking about, you know, more than a half a percent, 5,000 ppm or better, because that's what you need when you're drilling at these depths. So we're looking for an elephant. And I hope that we find it, because if I go back to this is a claim that we sold, that our company sold to Cameco in 2016. So you have to ask, why would they buy that? Because they think there's something big there. <laughs> That's the only reason, because it's 700, six, 700 meters to basement. I, I think there's a prevailing theory that there could be large deposits that still have not been found. And I think that Arrow started to show us that when, when next gen found their incredible deposit at depth that that gave people this momentum just to think of what could be in the areas along trend that that are just a little more difficult to work in because of the depth but what if there's elephants it's elephant country so here's the details of our particular deal with denison they issued us four and a half million dollars of their shares for an 80% interest. So we retained 20, 20% 20 interest were carried for the first $12 million. And their expenditures to date are just over half that. And what is gratifying is that they're coming back to the project. So they drilled 15 holes. We did some ground geophysics, but their plan, as I understand it for 2023, is a very deep penetrating airborne survey. And if I flip back to that map that I have gone back to once already, this particular system is being used in this region by a number of companies, by Cameco, by the PurePoint joint venture, as I understand, and now by Denison and ALX. And it's a, I know from experience that this can see a thousand meters not that you'd want to drill to a thousand meters and find targets there, but certainly that 500 to thousand meter target range, if there was something there that no one could ever see before, Z10 will see it. And I have the proof of that from work that we did at Black Lake and at Rio Lake in 2017. So I'm looking forward to new targets being developed and Denison wanting to drill them and were carried for the next $5.3 million of work. So our exploration philosophy in, in summary is we use historical work. It's free. It was often could just be the harbinger of, of something else. The historical exploration could only see so deep. They only had so much money. Um, there, there's more money that's entered the exploration market in the modern era, and we're using new tools. Artificial intelligence can help us, especially when, when you're looking for nickel, not as much for the Athabasca uranium because there's very little surface expression, but uh, alteration that can be seen from space or from high resolution photos, that's very important to find new mineral deposits. Ground truthing them, that's what we're doing with boots on the ground on all these lithium projects. You have to get out there, take samples. And that means helicopters buzzing in and out like, like Navy SEALs, that's what I call it. And use all the leading edge tools to develop targets 
and go drill them. And that's my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you, Warren, uh, for a very informative presentation. We'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a, a few questions. Um, first, with, uh, with regards to the geophysical survey at Mackenzie Lake, what signatures uh, would you look for that would indicate um, you know, continuity of, of neighboring discoveries uh, onto your property? So what we have done at Mackenzie Lake is we flew uh, a high resolution mag and radiometric survey, the same one that was used at Patterson Lake. And if I had, I could show you all of that, you know, in a different presentation, but this particular survey method, because the, the method is to fly as low as possible, it has a huge radiometric crystal. So we, we have found radiometric anomalies at Mackenzie Lake. Um, but they're a bit puzzling. There could be some kind of mass effect in in some of the uh, the boulder piles that we found uh, because we're 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 seeing definitely there's radioactivity in the rocks there. So what you're looking for in the mag is magnetic low channels or the edges between the mag highs and the mag lows. Uh, there's other people working in the area and they've been publishing their results as well and. And ours seem to fit very well with them. So where are we going with that? At this point, we don't have plans uh, to drill yet. We need to do more work on the ground. We rushed out there in, in late 2021, picked up a few samples, and that's all we've done outside of this very uh, tightly spaced high-resolution airborne survey. Um question here um how can an, it's a little bit open-ended question here but how can an exploration uh, drilling company add value to the service that supports the development of critical minerals okay can you just say that again <laughs> yes <laughs> uh how can an exploration company uh mm. add value to this i guess the service that supports the development of critical minerals well how can an exploration company participate in the critical metal, minerals uh, exploration industry? I mean, it's, it's really what you want to be in. The governments of Canada, the governments of the United States are granting money to people. Um, in, in Ontario, we're receiving, uh, we're, we're in line to get a $200,000 payment from the government because we drilled our electronickel project last year. Uh, that's a significant amount of money. And when you're getting support like that, that makes you want to keep going and, and keep doing things. So how do we deliver value to our shareholders? It's by using this momentum in the marketplace, using what the governments are offering us in the best way possible to go out and, and find new deposits. And, and any shareholder that, uh, you know, is getting our stock at five cents or less uh, in my experience, you know, when you make discoveries that that doesn't last, that that level of share price does not last. So, I mean, I have, uh, I own quite a number of shares, I think 3.6 million at last count. I want this company to succeed. And we're at a time right now, there's momentum that's being delivered and being stoked by car companies, governments. This is the best place for us to be right now. And for our shareholders. Great. Uh, one question here. What about the Rio Tinto deal? Are they doing any work in 2023? So Rio Tinto is not going to be working in 2023. Um, I, I, I'm going to choose my words carefully because we're still in the deal together. Um, there is a benefit to us that uh, because they, in order for them to make their 51%, it, it would have had to have been done by this coming August. Uh, but we are going to extend that for a year, and I hope that they'll be working in 2024. Okay, great. Um, and one question, kind of circling back on 
what you'd said about the shift to, uh, you know, kind of the battery metals and things. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you have an increased focus now on lithium, uh, as well as some some nickel activity. Um, how are you finding your shareholders are receiving this uh, this shift? Well, that's a good question because some people embrace it, understand that this is this is like a, an umbrella of things that that we're we're under, you know, nickel, copper, cobalt. LCT, pegmatites, uranium, that it, they are related. Others are more orthodox in how they think about, oh, well, are you a uranium company or what are you? Or are you a lithium company? Or are you just a flag that flies in the wind? But look, this whole business is about raising money and going out to find things. And we got into nickel because uranium was in the dumps. It was like $22 a pound or something. So U.S. for U308. So what do you do? You keep banging your head against the wall and hoping that something will change and waiting? Or do you embrace something that had momentum, that was on the upswing, and that was nickel? And, and so we went out and we did something, and we found 3% nickel in, in trenches and outcrop at the Firebird Project, and Rio Tinto did a deal with us. So I think those things are positive. I don't look at that as a negative. Uranium is, is a cruel mistress. It's, it's a tough thing to find. Uh, in my career, I've been lucky a couple of times. But, you, you know, it's, it's expensive, and you can't see it from surface, hardly ever. So uh, it takes a lot of money, millions of dollars, to completely search through a property and, until you're satisfied that either you found a deposit or, or it's time to move on. Uh, when it comes to lithium now, it's the same thing. Look, lithium, you can raise money for lithium because people know that it's so important for this electrification. So why would we ignore that? So we do have basically two groups of shareholders, those that that like uranium, uranium first, let's call them, and then the battery metals first. And I don't know, maybe we should all you know, meet in the middle somewhere, <laughs> have a party. <laughs> Great. Um, one other question here. At uh, best scenario, when can the drill rigs uh, go in the ground in, at the lithium projects in James Bay and Saskatchewan? Well, first we have to find the pegmatites. So that's the prospecting that we're funded for, uh, helicopter prospecting, going through the properties thoroughly, uh, hopefully getting samples back quickly. We had to wait quite a while uh, right through Christmas before we got our results from the October sampling. I don't want that to happen because this season is, I wouldn't say it's short, but you've got potentially June, July, August, September. you got, well, that's four months. Four months to find these things once you find them. And if we find one, then we can you can drill in the winter because you know where it is. So let's find them and get some drill targets. Great. Um, one question that folks always like to know is oh, what's the... Oh, oh, sorry, Timothy. There's yes. something there about Saskatchewan as okay. well. James, it's the same process. Okay. Yeah. We need to find the pegmatites that bear lithium before we can determine where to drill. We're not going to drill something that, that might be a pegmatite that doesn't carry lithium. Pardon the interruption. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what is the current treasury and what do you see as budgets uh, for spending and the breakdown on different projects over the next year? So our working capital right now is approximately 2.1 million. That's all of our cash and shares in other companies that we own. We've marketed uranium properties to an Australian company. We've marketed our Red Lake area. Uh, Red Lake District gold properties to first mining gold. So we have those as well. Um, but as far as, I mean, we a company like ours always has to raise money. We have $800,000 earmarked for James Bay in flow through. And we will raise flow through for uh, Saskatchewan, for Nova Scotia as well. Okay, great. Um, and... 
I think one final question. Um, obviously, you mentioned the the deals that you've done with Denison and Rio Tinto, as well as the other um, the other companies that you've brought in. Are, are, would you look to bring in more partners uh, for earning or JV agreements on projects? I think it's a, a good thing at this time. I mean, we've seen a contraction in our business uh, ever since the interest rates started to rise and money's getting a little harder to find. And so if somebody else is well-funded and, and has that uh, desire to get involved in Canada or in Quebec and Nova Scotia or Saskatchewan, it's definitely something we would consider the right partner, the right deal. Great. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, I'd like to thank Warren from ALX for speaking today. And thank you, everyone on the line for, for tuning in. Our webinar series continues tomorrow when we sit down with Atomic Minerals, uh, Tuesday, March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.